Section 5 of The Golden Spears and Other Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A recording done by Siobhan McKelpin. The Golden Spears and Other Fairy Tales by Edmund Leamy. Chapter 5 The Fairy Tree of Dovros. Once upon a time, the fairies of the west, going home from a hurling match with the fairies of the lakes, rested in Dovros Wood for three days and three nights. They spent the days feasting and the nights dancing in light of the moon, and they danced so hard that they wore the shoes off their feet, and for a whole week after, the leprechauns, the fairy shoemakers, were working night and day making new ones, and the rip rap tap tap of their little hammers were heard in all of the hedgerows. The food on which the fairies feasted was little red berries, which were so like those that grow in the rowan tree, that if you only looked at them, you might mistake one for the other. But the fairy berries grow only in fairyland, and are sweeter than any fruit that grows here in this world. And if an old man, bent and gray, ate one of them, he became young and active and strong again. And if an old woman, withered and wrinkled, ate one of them, she became young and bright and fair. And if a little maiden, who is not handsome, ate of them, she became lovelier than the flower of beauty. The fairies guarded the berries as carefully as a miser guards his gold. And whenever they were about to leave fairyland, they had to promise in the presence of the king and queen that they would not give a single berry to mortal man, nor allow one to fall upon the earth. For if a single berry fell upon the earth, a slender tree of many branches bearing clusters of berries would at once spring up, and mortal men might eat of them. But it was chance this time that they were in Dovros Wood that they kept up the feasting and dancing so long and were so full of joy because of their victory over the lake fairies that one little teeny weeny fairy, not much bigger than my finger, lost his head and dropped a berry in the wood. When the feast was ended, the fairies went back to fairyland and were at home for more than a week before they knew of the little fellow's fault. And this is how they came to know of it. A great wedding was about to come off, and the queen of the fairies sent six of her pages to Dovros Wood to catch fifty butterflies with golden spots on their purple wings, and fifty white without a speck or spot, and fifty golden, yellow as the cowslip, to make a dress for herself, and a hundred white without speck or spot to make dresses for the bride and the bridesmaids. When the pages came near the wood, they heard the most wonderful music, and the sky above them became quite dark, as if a cloud had shut out the sun. They looked up and saw that the cloud was formed of bees, who in a great swarm were flying towards the wood and humming as they flew. Seeing this, they were sore afraid until they saw the bees settling on a single tree, and on looking closely at the tree, they saw it was covered with fairy berries. The bees took no notice of the fairies, and so they were no longer afraid. And they hunted the butterflies until they had captured the full number of various colors. Then they returned to fairyland, and they told the queen about the bees and the berries, and the queen told the king. The king was very angry. And he set his heralds to the four corners of fairyland to summon all of his subjects to the presence that he might find out without delay who was the culprit. They all came except the little weeny fellow who dropped the berry. And of course everyone said it was fear that kept him away and that he must be guilty. The heralds were at once set in search of him. And after a while they found him hiding in a cluster of ferns and brought him before the king. The poor little fellow was so frightened that at first he could scarcely speak a word, but after a time he told how he never missed the berry until he had returned to fairyland, and that he was afraid to say anything to anyone about it. The king, who would hear of no excuse, sentenced the little culprit to be banished into the land of giants beyond the mountains, to stay there forever and a day unless he could find a giant willing to go to Dovros Wood and guard the fairy tree. 
When the king had pronounced sentence, everyone was very sorry because the little fellow was a favorite with them all. No fairy harper upon his harp or piper upon his pipe or fiddler upon his fiddle could play half so sweetly as he could play upon an ivy leaf. And when they remembered all the pleasant moonlit nights on which they had danced to his music and thought that they should never hear or dance to it any more, their little hearts were filled with sorrow. The queen was as sad as any of her subjects, but the king's word should be obeyed. When the time came for the little fellow to set out in exile, the queen sent her head page to him with a handful of berries. These, the queen said, he was to offer to the giants, and say at the same time that the giant who was willing to guard the tree could feast on berries just as sweet from morn till night. As the little fellow went on his way, nearly all the fairies followed him to the borders of the land, and when they saw him go up the mountain towards the land of the giants, they all took off their little red caps and waved them until he was out of sight. On he went walking all day and night, and when the sun rose on the morrow, he was on the top of the mountain, and he could see the land of the giants in the valley stretched far below him. Before beginning his descent, he turned round for a last glimpse of the fairyland, but he could see nothing, for a thick, dark cloud shut it out from view. He was very sad, and tired, and footsore, and as he struggled down the rough mountainside, he could not help thinking of the soft green woods and mossy pathways of the pleasant land he had left behind them. When he awoke, the ground was trembling, and a noise that sounded like thunder fell on his ears. He looked up and saw coming towards him a terrible giant, with one eye that burned like a live coal in the middle of his forehead. His mouth stretched from ear to ear. His teeth were long and crooked. The skin of his face was as black as night, and his arms and chest were all covered in black, shaggy hair. Round his body was an iron band, and hanging from this by a chain was a great club with iron spikes. With one blow of this club he could break a rock into splinters, and fire could not burn him, and water could not drown him, and weapons could not wound him, and there was no way to kill him but by giving him three blows of his own club. And he was so bad-tempered that the other giants called him Sharvan the Surly. When the giant spied the red cap of the little fairy, he gave the shout that sounded like thunder. The poor fairy was shaken from head to foot. What brought you here? said the giant. Please, Mr. Giant, said the fairy. The king of the fairies banished me here. And here I must stay forever in a day unless you come and guard the fairy tree in Dovrus Wood. Unless what? roared the giant, and he gave the fairy a touch of his foot that sent the little fellow rolling down head over heels. The poor fairy lay as if he were dead, and then the giant, feeling sorry for what he had done, took him up gently between his finger and thumb. Don't be frightened, little man, said he, and now... Tell me all about the tree. It is the tree of the fairy berry that grows in the wood of Dovras, said the fairy, and I have some of the berries with me. Oh, you have, have you, said the giant. Let me see them. The fairy took three berries from the pocket of his little green coat and gave them to the giant. The giant looked at them for a second. He then swallowed the three together, and when he had done so, he felt so happy that he began to shout and dance for joy. More, you little thief, said he. More, you little... Uh, what's your name? said the giant. Pinking, please, Mr. Giant, said the fairy. And he gave up all the berries. The giant shouted louder than before, and his shouts were heard by all the other giants who came running towards him. When Sharvan saw them coming, he caught up Pinkeen and put him in his pocket that they shouldn't see him. What were you shouting for, said the giants? Because, said Sharvan, 
That rock there fell down on my big toe. You did not shout like a man that was hurt, said they. What is it to you what way I shouted, said he. You might give a civil answer to a civil question, said they. But sure, you were always sharvin the surly. And they went away. When the giants were out of sight, Sharvin took Pinkeen out of his wallet. Some more berries, you little thief, I mean little Pinkeen, said he. I have not any more, said Pinkeen. But if you will guard the tree in Doverus Wood, you can feast on them from morn till night. I'll guard every tree in the wood if I may do that, said the giant. You'll only have to guard one, said Pinkeen. How am I to get it, said Sharvin. "'You must first come with me towards Fairyland,' said the fairy. "'Very well,' said Sharvin. "'Let us go.' "'And he took up the fairy and put him into his wallet, "'and before very long they were at the top of the mountain. "'Then the giant looked around towards the giant's land, "'but a black cloud shut it out from view, "'while the sun was shining on the valley that lay before him, "'and he could see away in the distance "'the green woods and the shining waters of Fairyland.' It was not long until he reached its borders, but when he tried to cross them, his feet stuck to the ground and he could not move a step. Sharvin gave three loud shouts that were heard all over Fairyland and made the trees in the woods tremble as if the wind of a storm was sweeping over them. Oh, please, Mr. Giant, let me out, said Pinkeen. Sharvin took out the little fellow, who, as soon as he saw was on the borders of Fairyland, ran as fast as his legs could carry him. And before he had gone very far, he met all the little fairies who, hearing the shouts of the giant, came trooping out from the ferns to see what was the matter. Pinkeen told them it was the giant who was to guard the tree, shouting because he was stuck fast on the borders, and they need to have no fear of him. The fairies were so delighted to have Pinkeen back again that they took him up on their shoulders and carried him to the king's palace. And all the harpers and pipers and fiddlers marched before him, playing the most jocund music that was ever heard. The king and queen were on the lawn in front of the palace when the gay procession came up and halted before them. The queen's eyes glistened with pleasure as she saw the little favorite, and the king was also glad at heart. But he looked very grave as he said, Why have you returned, sirrah? Then Pinkeen told his majesty that he had brought with him a giant who was willing to guard the fairy tree. And who is he and where is he? asked the king. The other giants call him Sharp in the Surly, said Pinkeen, and he is stuck fast outside the borders of fairyland. It is well, said the king. You are pardoned. When the fairies heard this, they tossed their little red caps in the air and cheered so loudly that a bee who was clinging to a rosebud fell senseless on the ground. Then the king ordered one of his pages to take a handful of berries and to go to Sharvin and show him the way to Dovrus Wood. The page, taking the berries with him, went off to Sharvin, whose roaring nearly frightened the poor little fellow to death. But as soon as the giant tasted the berries, he got into good humor, and he asked the page if he could remove the spell of enchantment from him. I can, said the page, and I will if you promise me that you will not try to cross the borders of fairyland. I promise that with all my heart, said the giant, but hurry on, my little man, for there are pins and needles in my legs. The page plucked a cowslip. And picking out the five little crimson spots in the cup of it, he flung one to the north, and one to the south, and one to the east, and one to the west, and one up into the sky. And the spell was broken, and the giant's limbs were free. Then Sharvin and the fairy page set off for Dovrus Wood, and it was not long until they came within view of the fairy tree. When Sharvin saw the berries glistening in the sun, he gave a shout so loud and strong that the wind of it blew the little fairy back into fairyland. But he had to return to the wood to tell the giant that he was to stay all day at the foot of the tree, ready to do battle with anyone who might come to steal the berries, and that during the night he was to sleep amongst the branches. All right, said the giant, who could scarcely speak as his mouth was full of berries. 
Well, the fame of the fairy tree spread far and wide, and every day some adventurer came to try if he could carry away some of the berries. But the giant, true to his word, was always on the watch, and not a single day passed on which he did not fight and slay a daring champion. And the giant never received a wound, for fire could not burn him, nor water drown him, nor weapon wound him. Now, at this time, when Sharvan was keeping watch and ward over the tree, a cruel king was reigning over the lands that looked towards the rising sun. He had slain the rightful king by foul means, and his subjects, loving their murdered sovereign, hated the usurper. But much as they hated him, they feared him more, for he was brave and masterful, and he was armed with a helmet and shield, which no weapon made by mortal hands could pierce. And he carried always with him two javelins that never missed their mark, and were so fatal that they were called the shafts of death. The murdered king had two children, a boy whose name was Nile, and a girl who was called Rosalind, that is, little rose, but no rose that ever bloomed was half as sweet or fresh or as fair as she. Cruel as the tyrant king was, he was too afraid of the people to kill the children. He sent the boy adrift on the sea in an open boat, hoping the waves would swallow it. And he got an old witch to cast a spell of deformity over Rosalind. And under the spell, her beauty faded until at last she became so ugly and wasted that scarcely anyone would speak to her. And, shunned by everyone, she spent her days in the outhouses with the cattle, and every night she cried herself to sleep. One day, when she was very lonely, a little robin came to pick the crumbs that had fallen about her feet. He appeared so tame that she offered him the bread from her hand, and when he took it, she cried with joy at finding that there was one living thing that did not shun her. After this, the robin came every day, and he sang so sweetly for her that she almost forgot her loneliness and misery. But once, while the robin was with her, the tyrant king's daughter, who was very beautiful, passed with her maids of honor, and, seeing Rosalind, the princess said, "'Oh, there is that horrid, ugly thing!' The maids laughed and giggled and said they had never seen such a fright. Poor Rosalind felt as if her heart would break. And when the princess and her maids were out of sight, she almost cried her eyes out. When the robin saw her crying, he perched on her shoulder and rubbed his little head against her neck and chirruped softly in her ear. And Rosalind was comforted, for she felt she had at least one friend in the world although it was only a little robin. But the robin could do no more for her than she could dream of. He heard the remark made by the princess, and he saw Rosalind's tears, and he knew now why she was shunned by everybody and why she was unhappy. And that very evening he flew off into Doverus Wood and called on a cousin of his and told him all about Rosalind. And you want some of the fairy berries, I suppose, said his cousin, Robin of the Wood. I do, said Rosalind's little friend. Ah, said Robin of the Wood, times have changed since you were here last. The tree is guarded now all day long by a surly giant. He sleeps in the branches during the night, and he breathes upon them and around them every morning, and his breath is poison to bird and bee. There is only one chance open, and if you try that, it may cost you your life. Then tell me what it is, for I would give a hundred lives for Rosalind, said her own little robin. Well, said the robin of the wood, every day a champion comes to battle with the giant, and the giant, before he begins the fight, puts a branch of berries in the iron belt that's around his waist, so that when he feels tired or thirsty, he can refresh himself. And there is just a bare chance while he is fighting of picking one of the berries from the branch. But if his breath fall on you, it is certain death. I will take the chance, said Rosalind's robin. Very well, said the other. And the two birds flew through the wood until they came within sight of the fairy tree. The giant was lying stretched at the foot of it, eating the berries, 
but it was not long until a warrior came who challenged him to battle. The giant jumped up and plucking a branch from the tree, stuck it in his belt and swinging his iron club above his head, strode towards the warrior and the fight began. The robin perched on a tree behind the giant and watched and waited for his chance. But it was a long time coming, for the berries were in the front of the giant's belt. At last the giant, with one great blow, struck the warrior down. But as he did, so he stumbled and fell upon him. And before he had time to recover himself, the little robin darted towards him like a flash and picked off one of the berries. And then, as fast as wings could carry him, he flew towards home. And on his way, he passed over a troop of warriors and snow-white steeds. All of the horsemen except one wore silver helmets and shining mantles of green silk, fastened by brooches of red gold. But the chief, who rode at the head of the troop, wore a green helmet, and his mantle was of yellow silk, and he looked by far the noblest of them all. When the robin had left the horsemen far behind him, he spied Rosalind sitting outside the palace gates, bemoaning her fate. The robin perched upon her shoulder, and almost before she knew he was there, he put a berry between her lips. And the taste was so delicious that Rosalind ate it at once. And that very moment, the witch's withering spell passed away from her, and she became as lovely as the flower of beauty. Just then, the warriors on the snow-white steeds came up, and the chief, with the mantle of yellow silk and the golden helmet, leaped from his horse, and bending his knee before her said, Fairest of all fair maidens, you are surely the daughter of the king of these realms, even though you are without the palace gates, unattended, and wear not royal robes. I am the prince of the sunny valleys. Daughter of a king I am, said Rosalind, but not of the king who rules these realms. And saying this, she fled, leaving the prince wondering who she could be. The prince then ordered his trumpeters to give notice of his presence outside the palace, and in a few moments the king and all his nobles came out to greet the prince and his warriors and give them welcome. That night a great feast was spread in the banquet hall, and the prince of the sunny valley sat by the king, and beside the prince sat the king's beautiful daughter, and then in due order sat the nobles of the court and the warriors who had come with the prince and on the wall behind each noble and the warrior was a shield and helmet were suspended flashing radiance through the room during the feast the prince spoke most graciously to the lovely lady at his side but all the time he was thinking of the unknown beauty he had met outside the palace gates and his heart longed for another glimpse of her when the feast was ended and the jeweled drinking cups had gone merrily around the table. The bard sang, to the accompaniment of harps, the courtship of the Lady Emer. And as they pictured her radiant beauty outshining that of all her maidens, the prince thought that fair as Lady Emer was, there was still one fairer. I come, said the prince, to look for a bride, for it was foretold to me in my own country that here only I should find a lady who is destined to share my throne. And fame reported that in your kingdom are to be found the loveliest maidens in all the world. And I can well believe that, added the prince, after what I have seen today. When the king's daughter heard this, she hung down her head and blushed like a rose. For, of course, she thought the prince was alluding only to herself, as she did not know that he had seen Rosalind, and she had not heard of the restoration of her beauty. Before another word could be spoken, a great noise and a clang of arms were heard outside of the palace. The king and his guests started from their seats and drew their swords, and the bards raised the song of battle. But their voices were stilled and their harps silenced when they saw at the threshold of the banquet hall a battle champion, in whose face they recognized the features of their murdered king. "'Tis Neil come back to his father's throne,' said the chief bard. "'Long live Neil! Long live Neil!' answered all the others. The king, white with rage and amazement, turned to the chiefs and nobles of his court and cried out, "'Is there none loyal enough to drive that intruder from the banquet hall?' But no one stirred, and no answer was given. Then the king rushed forward alone, but before he could reach the spot where Neil was standing, he was seized by a dozen chiefs and at once disarmed. During this scene, the king's daughter had fled frightened, 
but Roslyn, attracted by the noise and hearing her brother's name and the cheers for which greeted it, had entered the banquet hall unperceived by anyone. But when her presence was discovered, every eye was dazzled with her beauty. Neil looked at her for a second, wondering if the radiant maiden before him could be the little sister he had been separated from for so many years. And another second, she was clasped in his arms. Then the feast was spread again, and Neil told the story of his adventures. And when the prince of the Sunny Valley asked for the hand of Rosalind, Neil told his lovely sister to speak for herself. With downcast eyes and smiling lips, she said, yes. And that very day was the gayest and brightest wedding that ever took place. And Rosalind became the prince's bride. In her happiness, she did not forget the little Robin, who was her friend in sorrow. She took him home with her to Sunny Valleys, and every day she fed him with her own hands. And every day he sang for her the sweetest songs that were ever heard in the lady's bower. End of section 5「Section six of The Golden Spears and Other Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Spears and Other Fairy Tales by Edmund Leamy. Section six. The Little White Cat. A long, long time ago, in a valley far away, the giant Trenkos lived in a great castle, surrounded by trees that were always green. The castle had a hundred doors, and every door was guarded by a huge shaggy hound with tongue of fire and claws of iron, who tore to pieces anyone who went to the castle without the giant's leave. Trenkos had made war on the king of the torrents, and, having killed the king, and slain his people, and burned his palace, he carried off his only daughter, the Princess Eileen, to the castle in the valley. Here he provided her with beautiful rooms and appointed a hundred dwarfs, dressed in blue and yellow satin, to wait upon her, and harpers to play sweet music for her, and he gave her diamonds without number, brighter than the sun. But he would not allow her to go outside the castle, and told her if she went one step beyond its doors, the hounds with tongues of fire and claws of iron would tear her to pieces. A week after her arrival, war broke out between the giant and the king of the islands, and before he set out for battle, the giant sent for the princess and informed her that on his return he would make her his wife. When the princess heard this, she began to cry, for she would rather die than marry the giant who had slain her father. Crying will only spoil your bright eyes, my little princess, said Trenkos, and you will have to marry me whether you like it or no. He then bade her go back to her room, and he ordered the dwarfs to give her everything she asked for while he was away, and the harpers to play the sweetest music for her. When the princess gained her room, she cried as if her heart would break. The long day passed slowly, and the night came, but brought no sleep to Eileen, and in the grey light of the morning she rose and opened the window and looked about in every direction to see if there were any chance of escape. But the window was ever so high above the ground, and below were the hungry and ever watchful hounds. With a heavy heart she was about to close the window, when she thought she saw the branches of the tree that was nearest to it moving. She looked again, and she saw a little white cat creeping along one of the branches. Mew! cried the cat. Poor little pussy, said the princess. Come to me, pussy. Stand back from the window, said the cat, and I will. The princess stepped back, and the little white cat jumped into the room. The princess took the little cat on her lap and stroked him with her hand, and the cat raised up its back and began to purr. Where do you come from, and what is your name? asked the princess. No matter where I come from or what's my name, said the cat. I am a friend of yours, and I come to help you. I never wanted help worse, said the princess. I know that, said the cat. And now listen to me. 
when the giant comes back from battle and asks you to marry him say to him you will marry him but i will never marry him said the princess do what i tell you said the cat when he asks you to marry him say to him you will if his dwarfs will wind for you three balls from the fairy dew that lies on the bushes on a misty morning as big as these said the cat putting his right forefoot into his ear and taking out three balls one yellow one red and one blue they are very small said the princess they are not much bigger than peas and the dwarfs will not be long at their work won't they said the cat it will take them a month and a day to make one so that it will take three months and three days before the balls are wound but the giant like you will think they can be made in a few days and so he will readily promise to do what you ask he will soon find out his mistake but he will keep his word and will not press you to marry him until the balls are wound when will the giant come back asked eileen he will return tomorrow afternoon said the cat will you stay with me until then said the princess i am very lonely i cannot stay said the cat i have to go away to my palace on the island on which no man ever placed his foot and where no man but one shall ever come and where is that island asked the princess and who is the man the island is in the far-off seas where vessel never sailed the man you will see before many days are over and if all goes well he will one day slay the giant trenkos and free you from his power ah sighed the princess that can never be for no weapon can wound the hundred hounds that guard the castle and no sword can kill the giant trenkos there is a sword that will kill him said the cat but i must go now remember what you are to say to the giant when he comes home and every morning watch the tree on which you saw me and if you see in the branches any one you like better than yourself said the cat winking at the princess throw him these three balls and leave the rest to me but take care not to speak a single word to him for if you do all will be lost shall i ever see you again asked the princess time will tell answered the cat and without saying so much as good-bye he jumped through the window on to the tree and in a second was out of sight the morrow afternoon came and the giant trenkos returned from battle eileen knew of his coming by the furious barking of the hounds and her heart sank for she knew that in a few moments she would be summoned to his presence indeed he had hardly entered the castle when he sent for her and told her to get ready for the wedding the princess tried to look cheerful as she answered i will be ready as soon as you wish but you must first promise me something ask anything you like little princess said trenkos well then said eileen before i marry you you must make your dwarfs wind three balls as big as these from the fairy dew that lies on the bushes on a misty morning in summer is that all said trenkos laughing i shall give the dwarfs orders at once and by this time to-morrow the balls will be wound and our wedding can take place in the evening and will you leave me to myself until then i will said trenkos on your honour as a giant said eileen on my honour as a giant replied trenkos the princess returned to her rooms and the giant summoned all his dwarfs and he ordered them to go forth in the dawning of the morn and to gather all the fairy dew lying on the bushes and to wind three balls one yellow one red and one blue the next morning and the next and the next the dwarfs went out into the fields and searched all the hedgerows, but they could gather only as much fairy dew as would make a thread as long as a wee girl's eyelash, and so they had to go out morning after morning, and the giant fumed and threatened, but all to no purpose. He was very angry with the princess, and he was vexed with himself that she was so much cleverer than he was, 
and moreover he saw now that the wedding could not take place as soon as he expected when the little white cat went away from the castle he ran as fast as he could uphill and down dale and never stopped until he came to the prince of the silver river the prince was alone and very sad and sorrowful he was for he was thinking of the princess eileen and wondering where she could be Mew! said the cat as he sprang softly into the room but the prince did not heed him Mew! again said the cat but again the prince did not heed him Mew! said the cat the third time and he jumped up on the prince's knee where do you come from and what do you want asked the prince i come from where you would like to be said the cat and where is that said the prince oh where is that indeed as if i didn't know what you are thinking of and of whom you are thinking said the cat and it would be far better for you to try and save her i would give my life a thousand times over for her said the prince for whom said the cat with a wink i name no name your highness said he you know very well who she is said the prince if you knew what i was thinking of but do you know where she is she is in danger said the cat she is in the castle of the giant trenkos in the valley beyond the mountains i will set out there at once said the prince and i will challenge the giant to battle and will slay him easier said than done said the cat there is no sword made by the hands of man can kill him and even if you could kill him his hundred hounds with tongues of fire and claws of iron would tear you to pieces then what am i to do asked the prince be said by me said the cat go to the wood that surrounds the giant's castle and climb the high tree that's nearest to the window that looks towards the sunset and shake the branches and you will see what you will see then hold out your hat with the silver plumes and three balls one yellow one red and one blue will be thrown into it and then come back here as fast as you can but speak no word for if you utter a single word the hounds will hear you and you shall be torn to pieces well the prince set off at once and after two days journey he came to the wood around the castle and he climbed the tree that was nearest to the window that looked towards the sunset and he shook the branches as soon as he did so the window opened and he saw the princess eileen looking lovelier than ever he was going to call out her name but she placed her fingers on her lips and he remembered what the cat had told him that he was to speak no word in silence he held out the hat with the silver plumes and the princess threw into it the three balls one after another and blowing him a kiss she shut the window and well it was she did so for at that very moment she heard the voice of the giant who was coming back from hunting the prince waited until the giant had entered the castle before he descended the tree he set off as fast as he could he went up hill and down dale and never stopped until he arrived at his own palace and there waiting for him was the little white cat have you brought the three balls said he i have said the prince then follow me said the cat on they went until they left the palace far behind and came to the edge of the sea now said the cat unravel a thread of the red ball hold the thread in your right hand drop the ball into the water and you shall see what you shall see the prince did as he was told and the ball floated out to sea unravelling as it went and it went on until it was out of sight pull now said the cat the prince pulled and as he did he saw far away something on the sea shining like silver it came nearer and nearer and he saw it was a little silver boat at last it touched the strand now said the cat step into this boat and it will bear you to the palace on the island on which no man has ever placed his foot the island in the unknown seas that were never sailed by vessels made of human hands in that palace there is a sword with a diamond hilt and by that sword alone 
the giant trenkos can be killed there also are a hundred cakes and it is only on eating these the hundred hounds can die but mind what i say to you if you eat or drink until you reach the palace of the little cat in the island in the unknown seas you will forget the princess eileen i will forget myself first said the prince as he stepped into the silver boat which floated away so quickly that it was soon out of sight of land the day passed and the night fell and the stars shone down upon the waters but the boat never stopped on she went for two whole days and nights and on the third morning the prince saw an island in the distance and very glad he was for he thought it was his journey's end and he was almost fainting with thirst and hunger but the day passed and the island was still before him at long last on the following day he saw by the first light of the morning that he was quite close to it and that trees laden with fruit of every kind were bending down over the water the boat sailed round and round the island going closer and closer every round until at last the drooping branches almost touched it the sight of the fruit within his reach made the prince hungrier and thirstier than he was before and forgetting his promise to the little cat not to eat anything until he entered the palace in the unknown seas he caught one of the branches and in a moment was in the tree eating the delicious fruit while he was doing so the boat floated out to sea and soon was lost to sight but the prince having eaten forgot all about it and worse still forgot all about the princess in the giant's castle when he had eaten enough he descended the tree and turning his back on the sea set out straight before him he had not gone far when he heard the sound of music and soon after he saw a number of maidens playing on silver harps coming towards him when they saw him they ceased playing and cried out welcome welcome prince of the silver river welcome to the island of fruits and flowers our king and queen saw you coming over the sea and they sent us to bring you to the palace the prince went with them and at the palace gates the king and queen and their daughter kathleen received him and gave him welcome he hardly saw the king and queen for his eyes were fixed on the princess kathleen who looked more beautiful than a flower he thought he had never seen any one so lovely for of course he had forgotten all about poor eileen pining away in her castle prison in the lonely valley when the king and queen had given welcome to the prince a great feast was spread and all the lords and ladies of the court sat down to it and the prince sat between the queen and the princess kathleen and long before the feast was finished he was over head and heels in love with her when the feast was ended the queen ordered the ballroom to be made ready and when night fell the dancing began and was kept up until the morning star and the prince danced all night with the princess falling deeper and deeper in love with her every minute between dancing by night and feasting by day weeks went by all the time poor eileen in the giant's castle was counting the hours and all this time the dwarfs were winding the balls and a ball and a half were already wound at last the prince asked the king and queen for their daughter in marriage and they were delighted to be able to say yes and the day was fixed for the wedding but on the evening before the day on which it was to take place the prince was in his room getting ready for a dance when he felt something rubbing against his leg and looking down who should he see but the little white cat at the sight of him the prince remembered everything and sad and sorry he was when he thought of eileen watching and waiting and counting the days until he returned to save her but he was very fond of the princess kathleen and so he did not know what to do you can't do anything tonight said the cat for he knew what the prince was thinking of but when morning comes go down to the sea and look not to the right or the left 
and let no living thing touch you, for if you do, you shall never leave the island. Drop the second ball into the water, as you did the first, and when the boat comes, step in at once. Then you may look behind you, and you shall see what you shall see, and you'll know which you love best, the Princess Eileen or the Princess Kathleen, and you can either go or stay. The prince didn't sleep a wink that night, and at the first glimpse of the morning he stole from the palace. When he reached the sea he threw out the ball, and when it had floated out of sight he saw the little boat sparkling on the horizon like a newly risen star. The prince had scarcely passed through the palace doors when he was missed, and the king and queen and the princess and all the lords and ladies of the court went in search of him, taking the quickest way to the sea while the maidens with the silver harps played sweetest music, the princess, whose voice was sweeter than any music, called on the prince by his name, and so moved his heart that he was about to look behind when he remembered how the cat had told him he should not do so until he was in the boat. Just as it touched the shore, the princess put out her hand and almost caught the prince's arm, but he stepped into the boat in time to save himself, and it sped away like a receding wave. A loud scream caused the prince to look round suddenly, and when he did, he saw no sign of king or queen or princess or lords or ladies, but only big green serpents with red eyes and tongues that hissed out fire and poison as they writhed in a hundred horrible coils. The prince, having escaped from the enchanted island, sailed away for three days and three nights, and every night he hoped the coming morning would show him the island he was in search of. He was faint with hunger and beginning to despair, when on the fourth morning he saw in the distance an island that, in the first rays of the sun, gleamed like fire. On coming closer to it, he saw that it was clad with trees, so covered with bright red berries that hardly a leaf was to be seen. Soon the boat was almost within the stone's cast of the island, and it began to sail round and round until it was well under the bending branches. The scent of the berries was so sweet that it sharpened the prince's hunger, and he longed to pluck them. But, remembering what had happened to him on the enchanted island, he was afraid to touch them. But the boat kept on sailing round and round, and at last a great wind rose from the sea and shook the branches and the bright sweet berries fell into the boat until it was filled with them. And they fell upon the prince's hands, and he took up some to look at them. And as he looked, the desire to eat them grew stronger, and he said to himself, it would be no harm to taste one but when he tasted it, the flavour was so delicious, he swallowed it. And of course, at once, he forgot all about Eileen. And the boat drifted away from him and left him standing in the water. He climbed onto the island and having eaten enough of the berries, he set out to see what might be before him. And it was not long until he heard a great noise and a huge iron ball knocked down one of the trees in front of him. And before he knew where he was, a hundred giants came running after it. When they saw the prince, they turned towards him and one of them caught him up in his hand and held him up that all might see him. The prince was nearly squeezed to death and seeing this, the giant put him on the ground again. Who are you, my little man? asked the giant. I am a prince, replied the prince. Oh, you are a prince, are you? said the giant. And what are you good for? said he. The prince did not know, for nobody had asked him that question before. I know what he's good for, said an old giantess, with one eye in her forehead and one in her chin. I know what he's good for. He's good to eat. When the giants heard this, they laughed so loud that the prince was frightened almost to death. Why, 
said one. He wouldn't make a mouthful. Oh, leave him to me, said the giantess, and I'll fatten him up. And when he is cooked and dressed, he will be a nice dainty dish for the king. The giants, on this, gave the prince into the hands of the old giantess. She took him home with her to the kitchen and fed him on sugar and spice and all things nice, so that he should be a sweet morsel for the king of the giants when he returned to the island. The poor prince would not eat anything at first, but the giantess held him over the fire until his feet were scorched, and then he said to himself it was better to eat than to be burnt alive. Well, day after day passed, and the prince grew sadder and sadder, thinking that he would soon be cooked and dressed for the king. But sad as the prince was, he was not half as sad as the princess Eileen in the giant's castle, watching and waiting for the prince to return and save her. And the dwarfs had wound two balls and were winding a third. At last the prince heard from the old giantess that the king of the giants was to return on the following day. And she said to him, As this is the last night you have to live, tell me if you wish for anything, for if you do, your wish will be granted. I don't wish for anything, said the prince, whose heart was dead within him. Well, I'll come back again, said the giantess, and she went away. The prince sat down in a corner, thinking and thinking, until he heard close to his ear a sound like prrr, prrr. He looked around, and there before him was the little white cat. I ought not to come to you, said the cat, but indeed it is not for your sake I come. I come for the sake of the princess Eileen. Of course, you forgot all about her, and of course, she is always thinking of you. It's always the way favoured lovers may forget, slighted lovers never yet. The prince blushed with shame when he heard the name of the princess. "'Tis you that ought to blush,' said the cat. "'But listen to me now, and remember, if you don't obey my directions this time, you'll never see me again, and you'll never set your eyes on the princess Eileen. When the old giantess comes back, tell her you wish, when the morning comes, to go down to the sea to look at it for the last time. When you reach the sea, you will know what to do. But I must go now, as I hear the giantess coming.' and the cat jumped out of the window and disappeared. Well, said the giantess when she came in, is there anything you wish? Is it true I must die tomorrow? asked the prince. It is. Then, said he, I should like to go down to the sea to look at it for the last time. You may do that, said the giantess, if you get up early. I'll be up with a lark in the light of the morning, said the prince. Very well, said the giantess, and saying, Good night, she went away. The prince thought the night would never pass, but at last it faded away before the grey light of the dawn, and he sped down to the sea. He threw out the third ball, and before long he saw the little boat coming towards him swifter than the wind. He threw himself into it the moment it touched the shore. Swifter than the wind, it bore him out to sea, and before he had time to look behind him, the island of the giantess was like a faint red speck in the distance. The day passed, and the night fell, and the stars looked down, and the boat sailed on, and just as the sun rose above the sea, it pushed its silver prow on the golden strand of an island greener than the leaves in summer. The prince jumped out and went on and on, until he entered a pleasant valley, at the head of which he saw a palace white as snow. As he approached the central door, it opened for him. On entering the hall, he passed into several rooms without meeting with anyone. But when he reached the principal apartment, he found himself in a circular room in which were a thousand pillars, and every pillar was of marble, and on every pillar save one, which stood in the centre of the room, was a little white cat with black eyes. Ranged round the wall, from one door jamb to the other, were three rows of precious jewels. 
The first was a row of brooches of gold and silver, with their pins fixed in the wall and their heads outwards. The second, a row of torques of gold and silver. And the third, a row of great swords with hilts of gold and silver. And on many tables was food of all kinds and drinking horns filled with foaming ale. While the prince was looking about him, the cats kept on jumping from pillar to pillar. But seeing that none of them jumped onto the pillar in the centre of the room, he began to wonder why this was so, when, all of a sudden, and before he could guess how it came about, there right before him on the centre pillar was the little white cat. "'Don't you know me?' said he. "'I do,' said the prince. "'Ah, but you don't know who I am. This is the palace of the little white cat, and I am the king of the cats.' But you must be hungry, and the feast is spread. Well, when the feast was ended, the king of the cats called for the sword that would kill the giant Trenkos and the hundred cakes for the hundred watchdogs. The cats brought the sword and the cakes and laid them before the king. Now, said the king, take these, you have no time to lose. Tomorrow the dwarfs will wind the last ball, and tomorrow the giant will claim the princess for his bride. So you should go at once, but before you go, take this from me to your little girl. And the king gave him a brooch lovelier than any on the palace walls. The king and the prince, followed by the cats, went down to the strand, and when the prince stepped into the boat, all the cats mewed three times for good luck, and the prince waved his hat three times, and the little boat sped over the waters all through the night as brightly and as swiftly as a shooting star. In the first flush of the morning, it touched the strand. The prince jumped out and went on and on, up hill and down dale, until he came to the giant's castle. When the hounds saw him, they barked furiously and bounded towards him to tear him to pieces. The prince flung the cakes to them, and as each hound swallowed his cake, he fell dead. The prince then struck his shield three times with a sword which he had brought from the palace of the little white cat. When the giant heard the sound, he cried out, Who comes to challenge me on my wedding day? The dwarfs went out to sea, and returning, told him it was a prince who challenged him to battle. The giant foaming with rage, seized his heaviest iron club and rushed out to the fight. The fight lasted the whole day, and when the sun went down, the giant said, We have had enough of fighting for the day. We can begin at sunrise tomorrow. Not so, said the prince. Now or never, win or die. Then take this, cried the giant, as he aimed a blow with all his force at the prince's head, but the prince, darting forward like a flash of lightning, drove his sword into the giant's heart, and, with a groan, he fell over the bodies of the poisoned hounds. When the dwarfs saw the giant dead, they began to cry and tear their hair, but the prince told them they had nothing to fear, and he bade them go and tell the princess Eileen he wished to speak with her. But the princess had watched the battle from her window, and when she saw the giant fall she rushed out to greet the prince, and that very night he and she and all the dwarfs and harpers set out for the palace of the Silver River, which they reached the next morning. And from that day to this, there never has been a gayer wedding than the wedding of the prince of the Silver River and the princess Eileen. And though she had diamonds and pearls to spare, the only jewel she wore on her wedding day was the brooch which the prince had brought her from the palace of the little white cat in the far off seas. End of section six. Recording by Ulrike Denis. Section seven of the Golden Spears and Other Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Golden Spears and Other Fairy Tales by Edmund Leamy Princess Finola and a Dwarf A long, long time ago, 
there lived in a little hut in the midst of a bare brown lonely moor an old woman and a young girl the old woman was withered sour-tempered and dumb the young girl was as sweet and as fresh as an opening rosebud and her voice was as musical as the whisper of a stream in the woods in the hot days of summer the little hut made of branches woven closely together was shaped like a beehive in the centre of the hut a fire burnt night and day from year's end to year's end though it was never touched or tended by human hand in the cold days and nights of winter it gave out light and heat that made the hut cosy and warm but in the summer nights and days it gave out light only with their heads to the wall of the hut and their feet towards the fire were two sleeping couches one of plain woodwork in which slept the old woman the other was finola's it was of bog oak polished as a looking-glass and on it were carved flowers and birds of all kinds that gleamed and shone in the light of the fire this couch was fit for a princess and a princess finola was though she did not know it herself outside the hut the bare brown lonely moor stretched for miles on every side but towards the east it was bounded by a range of mountains that looked to finola blue in the daytime but which put on a hundred changing colours as the sun went down nowhere was a house to be seen nor a tree nor a flower nor sign of any living thing from morning till night nor hum of bee nor song of bird nor voice of man nor any sound fell on finola's ear when the storm was in the air the great waves thundered on the shore beyond the mountains and the wind shouted in the glens but when it sped across the moor it lost its voice and passed as silently as the dead at first the silence frightened finola but she got used to it after a time and often broke it by talking to herself and singing the only other person beside the old woman finola ever saw was a dumb dwarf who mounted on a broken-down horse came once a month to the hut bringing with him a sack of corn for the old woman and finola although he couldn't speak to her finola was always glad to see the dwarf and his old horse and she used to give them cake made with her own white hands as for the dwarf he would have died for the little princess he was so much in love with her and often and often his heart was heavy and sad as he thought of her pining away in the lonely moor it chanced that he came one day and she did not as usual come out to greet him he made signs to the old woman but she took up a stick and struck him and beat his horse and drove him away but as he was leaving he caught a glimpse of finola at the door of the hut and saw that she was crying this sight made him so very miserable that he could think of nothing else but her sad face that he had always seen so bright and he allowed the old horse to go on without minding where he was going suddenly he heard a voice saying it is time for you to come the dwarf looked and right before him at the foot of a green hill was a little man not half as big as himself dressed in a green jacket with brass buttons and a red cap and tassel it is time for you to come he said the second time but you are welcome anyhow get off your horse and come in with me that i may touch your lips with the wand of speech that we may have a talk together the dwarf got off his horse and followed the little man through a hole in the side of a green hill the hole was so small that he had to go on his hands and knees to pass through it and when he was able to stand it was only the same height as the little fairy man after walking three or four steps they were in a splendid room as bright as day diamonds sparkled in the roof as stars sparkled in the sky when the night is without a cloud the roof rested on golden pillars and between the pillars were silver lamps but their light was dimmed by that of the diamonds in the middle of the room was a table on which were two golden plates and two silver knives and forks and a brass bell as big as a hazelnut and beside the table were two little chairs covered with blue silk and satin 
take a chair said the fairy and it will ring for the wand of speech the dwarf sat down and the fairyman rang the little brass bell and in came a little weeny dwarf no bigger than your hand bring me the wand of speech said the fairy and the weeny dwarf bowed three times and walked out backwards and in a minute he returned carrying a little black wand with a red berry at the top of it and giving it to the fairy he bowed three times and walked out backwards as he had done before the little man waved the rod three times over the dwarf and struck him once on the right shoulder and once on the left shoulder and then touched his lips with the red berry and said speak the dwarf spoke and he was so rejoiced at hearing the sound of his own voice that he danced about the room who are you at all at all said he to the fairy who is yourself said the fairy but come before we have any talk let us have something to eat for i am sure you are hungry then they sat down to table and the fairy rang the little brass bell twice and the weeny dwarf brought in two boiled snails in their shells and when they had eaten the snails he brought in a dormouse and when they had eaten the dormouse he brought in two wrens and when they had eaten the wrens he brought in two nuts full of wine and they became very merry and the fairyman sang cooling dusk and the dwarf sang the little black bird of the glen did you ever hear the foggy dew said the fairy no said the dwarf well then i'll give it to you but we must have some more wine and the wine was brought and he sang the foggy dew and the dwarf said it was the sweetest song he had ever heard and that the fairyman's voice would coax the birds off bushes you asked me who i am said the fairy i did said the dwarf and i asked you who is yourself you did said the dwarf and who are you then well to tell the truth i don't know said the dwarf and he blushed like a rose well tell me what you know about yourself i remember nothing at all said the dwarf before the day i found myself going along with a crowd of all sorts of people to the great fair of the liffey we had to pass by the king's palace on our way and as we were passing the king sent for a band of jugglers to come and show their tricks before him i followed the jugglers to look on and when the play was over the king called me to him and asked me who i was and where i came from i was dumb then and couldn't answer but even if i could speak i could not tell him what he wanted to know for i remembered nothing of myself before that day then the king asked the jugglers but they knew nothing about me and no one knew anything and then the king said he would take me into his service and the only work i have to do is to go once a month with a bag of corn to the hut in the lonely moor and there he fell in love with the little princess said the fairy winking at the dwarf the poor dwarf blushed twice as much as he has done before you need not blush said the fairy it is a good man's case and now tell me truly do you love the princess and what would you give to free her from the spell of enchantment that is over her i would give my life said the dwarf well then listen to me said the fairy the princess finola was banished to the lonely moor by the king your master he killed her father who was the rightful king and would have killed finola only it was told by an old sorceress that if he killed her he would die himself on the same day and she advised him to banish her to the lonely moor and she said she would fling a spell of enchantment over it and that until the spell was broken finola could not leave the moor and the sorceress also promised that she would send an old woman to watch over the princess by night and by day so that no harm should come to her but she told the king that he himself should select the messenger to take food to the hut and that he should look out for someone who had never seen or heard of the princess and whom he could trust never to tell anyone anything about her 
and that is the reason he selected you. Since you know so much, said the dwarf, can you tell me who I am and where I came from? You will know that time enough, said the fairy. I have given you back your speech. It will depend solely on yourself whether you will get back your memory of who and what you were before the day you entered the king's service. But are you really willing to try and break the spell of enchantment and free the princess? I am, said the dwarf. Whatever it will cost you. Yes, if it cost me my life, said the dwarf. But tell me, how can the spell be broken? Oh, it is easy enough to break the spell if you have the weapons, said the fairy. And what are they, and where are they, said the dwarf. The spear of the shining haft, and the dark blue blade and the silver shield, said the fairy. They are on the farther bank of the mystic lake in the island of the western seas. They are there for the man who is bold enough to seek them. If you are the man who will bring them back to the lonely moor, you will only have to strike the shield three times with the haft, and three times with the blade of the spear, and the silence of the moor will be broken for ever. The spell of enchantment will be removed, and the princess will be free. I will set out at once, said the dwarf, jumping from his chair. And whatever it costs you, said the fairy, will you pay the price? I will, said the dwarf. Well, then, mount your horse, give him his head, and he will take you to the shore opposite the island of the mystic lake. You must cross to the island on his back, and make your way through the water steeds that swim around the island night and day to guard it. But woe betide you, if you attempt to cross without paying the price. For if you do, the angry water steeds will rend you and your horse to pieces. And when you come to the mystic lake, you must wait until the waters are as red as wine, and then swim your horse across it, and on the farther side you will find the spear and shield. But woe betide you if you attempt to cross the lake before you pay the price, for if you do, the black cormorants of the western seas will pick the flesh from your bones. What is the price? said the dwarf. You will know that time enough said the fairy, but now go, and good luck go with you. The dwarf thanked the fairy and said goodbye. He then threw the reins on his horse's neck and started up the hill that seemed to grow bigger and bigger as he ascended, and the dwarf soon found that what he took for a hill was a great mountain. After travelling all the day, toiling up by steep crags and heathery passes, he reached the top as the sun was setting in the ocean, and he saw far below him, out in the water, the island of the mystic lake. He began his descent to the shore, but long before he reached it the sun had set, and darkness, unpierced by a single star, dropped upon the sea. The old horse, worn out by his long and painful journey, sank beneath him, and the dwarf was so tired that he rolled off his back and fell asleep by his side. He awoke at the breaking of the morning, and saw that he was almost at the water's edge. He looked out to sea, and saw the island, but nowhere could he see the water steeds, and he began to fear he must have taken a wrong course in the night, and that the island before him was not the one he was in search of. But even while he was so thinking, he heard fierce and angry snortings, and, coming swiftly from the island to the shore, he saw the swimming and prancing steeds. Sometimes their heads and manes only were visible, and sometimes, rearing, they rose half out of the water, and striking it with their hoofs, churned it into foam, and tossed the white spray to the skies. As they approached nearer and nearer, their snortings became more terrible, and their nostrils shot forth clouds of vapour. The dwarf trembled at sight and sound, and his old horse, quivering in every limb, moaned piteously, as if in pain. On came the steeds, until they almost touched the shore, then rearing, they seemed about to spring on to it. The frightened dwarf turned his head to fly, 
and as he did so he heard the twang of a golden harp and right before him who should he see but the little man at the hills holding a harp in one hand and striking the strings with the other are you ready to pay the price said he nodding gaily to the dwarf as he asked the question the listening water steed snorted more furiously than ever are you ready to pay the price said the little man a second time a shower of spray tossed on shore by the angry steeds drenched the dwarf to the skin and sent a cold shiver to his bones and he was so terrified that he could not answer for the third and last time are you ready to pay the price asked the fairy as he flung the harp behind him and turned to depart when the dwarf saw him going he thought of the little princess in the lonely moor and his courage came back and he answered bravely yes i am ready the water steeds hearing his answer and snorting with rage struck the shore with their pounding hoofs back to your waves cried the little harper and as he ran his finger across the lyre, the frightened steeds drew back into the waters what is the price asked the dwarf your right eye said the fairy and before the dwarf could say a word the fairy scooped out the eye with his finger and put it into his pocket the dwarf suffered most terrible agony but he resolved to bear it for the sake of the little princess then the fairy sat down on a rock at the edge of the sea and after striking a few notes he began to play in the strains of slumber the sound crept along the waters and the steeds so ferocious a moment before became perfectly still they had no longer any motion of their own and they floated on the top of the tide like foam before a breeze now said the fairy as he led the dwarf's horse to the edge of the tide the dwarf urged the horse into the water and once out of his death the old horse struck out boldly for the island the sleeping water steeds drifted helplessly against him and in a short time he reached the island safely and he neighed joyously as his hoofs touched solid ground the dwarf rode on and on until he came to a bridle path and following this it led him up through winding lanes bordered with golden furzy that filled the air with fragrance and brought him to the summit of the green hills that girdled and looked down on the mystic lake here the horse stopped of his own accord and the dwarf's heart beat quickly as his eye rested on the lake that clipped round by the ring of hills seemed in the breezeless and sunlit air as still as death and as bright as life can be after gazing at it for a long time he dismounted and lay at his ease in the pleasant grass hour after hour passed but no change came over the face of the waters and when the night fell sleep closed the eyelids of the dwarf the song of the lark awoke him in the early morning and starting up he looked at the lake but its waters were as bright as they had been the day before towards midday he beheld what he thought was a black cloud sailing across the sky from east to west it seemed to grow larger as it came nearer and nearer and when it was high above the lake he saw it was a huge bird the shadow of whose outstretched wings darkened the waters of the lake and the dwarf knew it was one of the cormorants of the western seas as it descended slowly he saw that it held in one of its claws a branch of a tree larger than a full-grown oak and laden with clusters of ripe red berries it alighted at some distance from the dwarf and after resting for a time it began to eat the berries and to throw the stones into the lake and wherever a stone fell a bright red stain appeared in the water as he looked more closely at the bird the dwarf saw that it had all the signs of old age and he could not help wondering how it was able to carry such a heavy tree 
later in the day two other birds as large as the first but younger came up from the west and settled down beside him they also ate the berries and throwing the stones into the lake it was soon as red as wine when they had eaten all the berries the young birds began to pick the decayed feathers off the old bird and to smooth his plumage as soon as they had completed their task he rose slowly from the hill and sailed out over the lake and dropping down on the waters dived beneath them in a moment he came to the surface and shot up into the air with a joyous cry and flew off to the west in all the vigour of a new youth followed by the other birds when they had gone so far that they were like specks in the sky the dwarf mounted his horse and descended towards the lake he was almost at the margin and in another minute would have plunged in when he heard a fierce screaming in the air and before he had time to look up the three birds were hovering over the lake the dwarf drew back frightened the birds wheeled over his head and then swooping down they flew close to the water covering it with their wings and uttering harsh cries then rising to a great height they folded their wings and dropped headlong like three rocks on the lake crashing its surface and scattering a wine-red shower upon the hills then the dwarf remembered what the fairy told him that if he attempted to swim the lake without paying the price the three cormorants of the western seas would pick the flesh off his bones he knew not what to do and was about to turn away when he heard once more the twang of the golden harp and the little fairy of the hills stood before him faint hearts never won fair lady said the little harper are you ready to pay the price despair and shield are on the opposite bank and the princess finola is crying this moment in the lonely moor at the mention of finola's name the dwarf's heart grew strong yes he said i am ready win or die what is the price your left eye said the fairy and as soon as said he scooped out the eye and put it in his pocket the poor blind dwarf almost fainted with pain it's your last trial said the fairy and now do what i tell you twist your horse's mane round your right hand and i will lead him to the water plunge in and fear not i gave you back your speech when you reach the opposite bank you will get back your memory and you will know who and what you are then the fairy led the horse to the margin of the lake in with you now and good luck go with you said the fairy the dwarf urged the horse he plunged into the lake and went down and down until his feet struck the bottom then he began to ascend and as he came near the surface of the water the dwarf thought he saw a glimmering light and when he rose above the water he saw the bright sun shining and the green hills before him and he shouted with joy at finding his sight restored but he saw more instead of the old horse he had ridden into the lake he was bestride a noble steed and as the steed swam to the bank the dwarf felt a change coming over him and an unknown vigour in his limbs when the steed touched the shore he galloped up the hillside and on the top of the hill was a silver shield bright as the sun resting against the spear standing upright in the ground the dwarf jumped off and running towards the shield he saw himself as in a looking-glass he was no longer a dwarf but a gallant knight at that moment his memory came back to him and he knew he was Konal, one of the knights of the red branch and he remembered now that the spell of dumbness and deformity had been cast upon him by the witch of the palace of the quicken trees slinging his shield upon his left arm he plucked the spear from the ground and leapt on to the source with a light heart he swam back over the lake and nowhere could he see the black cormorants of the western seas but three white swans floating abreast followed him to the bank when he reached the bank he galloped down to the sea and crossed to the shore 
then he flung the reins upon his horse's neck and swifter than the wind the gallant horse swept on and on and it was not long until he was bounding over the enchanted moor wherever his hoofs struck the ground grass and flowers sprang up and great trees with leafy branches rose on every side at last the knight reached the little hut three times he struck the shield with the haft and three times with the blade of his spear at the last blow the hut disappeared and standing before him was the little princess the knight took her in his arms and kissed her then he lifted her on to the horse and leaping up before her he turned towards the north to the palace of the red branch knights and as they rode on beneath the leafy trees from every tree the birds sang out for the spell of silence over the lonely moor was broken for ever end of section 7 recording by phone end of the golden spares and other fairy tales by edmund leamy